Section 5.3 is graphing radical functions. So we're going to focus on graphing square roots and cube roots. So a radical function contains a radical expression with the independent variable inside the radicand. So basically you have an x inside the radical. A square root function is when the radical is square root. Cube root function is when the ra uh, radical is a cube root. So pretty self-explanatory. Um, like I said, we're just going to focus on graphing square roots and cube roots. So we'll start with the parent functions. So the parent function for a square root is f of x equals the square root of x, and the uh, parent function for a cube root is g of x equals the cube root of x, or it could be f of x, x and I wrote it as f of x up here, but you know it's pretty interchangeable. So when we're graphing square roots, so f of x equals the square root of x, you want to focus on what x values that we can plug in and get a whole number out. So we focus on like the first few perfect squares so that we can plug in for x and get a just a whole number out so it's easy for us to graph. So the smallest perfect squares that we can put into a table to get points are 0, 1, and 4. So for my table, I'm going to pick 0, 1, and 4. And we'll talk about why you only really need three points for a square root in a second. So if I input 0 into the square root of x, the square root of 0 is 0, the square root of 1 is 1, the square root of 4 is 2. So I have the point 0, 0. 1, 1, and 4, 2. And then we can connect through our points. If I had picked a smaller number for x, I would have gotten an imaginary number. So if I had picked a number smaller than 0, that would have been a negative number inside the radical. So it would have ended up with an imaginary number, something that we can't graph. So this graph actually ends right here ends or starts the way you want to look at it. Um, there's no points to the left of this point, and there's going to be no points below this point either because this graph is going to keep steadily increasing as it moves to the right. So there's going to be a domain and a range restriction. So the domain, since this is my leftmost point, the 0, 0, I can't have any x values smaller than 0. So if I have any x values smaller than 0, I'm going to end up with imaginary when I take the square root of a negative number. So my domain has to be x is greater than or equal to 0. And then for my range, the range of the y coordinates is also cut off at this point also. So my range has to be y is greater than or equal to 0 as well. Because there's no way, there's no value that I'm going to put in for x to where I get a negative y out. So really whatever this kind of like starting point is on your graph, that's going to tell you where the domain and range is restricted to. Because there's going to be no points to the left of this point and no points below this point. So x is greater than or equal to 0 has to be to the right of this point. Or y is greater than or equal to 0 has to be above this point. And then for the cubed root of x, so f of x equals the cubed root of x, we have to include some more points in our table because you can take the cubed root of a negative number. So for a cubed root, you want five points, and we want to focus on like the smallest perfect cubes that there are. So we can take the cubed root of zero, we can take the cubed root of one and of negative one, and then we can take the cubed root of eight and negative eight. So those would be the like five smallest numbers. So if we set up our table negative eight, negative 1, 0, 1, and 8, and take the cubed root of each. So the cubed root of negative 8 is negative 2. So negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4, and then times a third, negative 2 becomes negative 8. The cubed root of negative 1 is negative 1 also. The cubed root of 0 is 0. The cubed root of 1 is positive 1 and the cubed root of 8 is positive 2. So we can plot those five points. So negative 8, negative 2, I'm going to go left 8, down 2. Negative 1, negative 1, left 1, down 1. 0, 0, 1, 1, and then 8, 2. So with the cubed root graph, it curves through the middle to go through these three points. And then it gets pretty flat around the edges. So it's pretty much shaped like that. 
And then when we go to think about domain and range this time, it looks like there's not going to be any restrictions and there's not. Because I can plug in any number that I want for x. It doesn't have to be positive because I'm taking the cube root. So I can go as far down on my x-coordinates as I want. I can go as far up as I want. It could be any negative number, any positive number, and still get a real number out. Even if it's a decimal, it's still a real number. We're just not um, going to get an imaginary number out of a cubed root. So for my domain for a cubic function, it's all real numbers. You can also tell by looking at a graph because you can see that the graph is going to extend in both directions for x forever. So to negative infinity and to positive infinity. And then for my range, range is also all real numbers because it looks like these lines start to go flat, but they're still going to continue to increase very slowly. So range is all real numbers because eventually I can reach down to negative infinity for my y values and up to positive infinity for my y values too. It just doesn't, it'll go up and down a lot slower than my domain because of the way the graph is shaped. And then for example one, we're going to graph the following functions, describe the transformation from the parent function. So the transformations pretty much are going to continue to work the same way as they have the whole year. So for number one, g of x equals the square root of x minus three inside the radical plus four. So this minus three inside the radical is telling me that I need to go right three. And then this plus four outside of the radical is telling me that I need to go up four. So if we're just graphing based on transformations from the parent function, especially if they're just translations, it's really easy just to take the original parent function and count those points off. So if it's a square root, my parent function was originally at 0, 0, 1, 1, and 4, 2. And I'm just going to count 3 right and 4 up for each of those points. So 0, 0 ends up at 3 and then 4. And then 1, 1 is going to end up at 4 and then 5. And then 4, 2 is going to end up at 7, 6. And if you start to begin, or if you start to recognize like the shape of each graph, you can also kind of just count off like the dis distance between each point. Like from my parent function, I go up one, right one from that first point. So from this point, I go up one, right one. From my original first point, I have to go up to right four. From this point, I went up to right four. So you can do it either way. You can count off all the points or you can just kind of notice like the relationship between the points. But the biggie here is just because I moved my starting point doesn't mean the graph is going to extend to the left. This is still my starting point. So it's like an end point for this function, and it's only going to extend to the right from this point. Because if I tried to plug in, like, say, x equals, or x equals 1, even, right here, and try to get a point right here, I would put 1 in for x, 1 minus 3 is negative 2, and then I would have a negative 2 inside the radical, which is not a real number, it's imaginary. So this is our graph, we're not going to extend to the left. For the domain, the domain is going to change because my starting point changed. So my starting point moved from 0, 0 to 3, 4. So now x has to be greater than or equal to 3. It's not going to be less than 3. It's not going to be 2, not going to be 1, because that's going to get me a negative inside the radical. So the domain is x is greater than or equal to 3. The range is going to be y. And this time it has to be greater than or equal to 4. So I'm never going to be able to get any points lower than that 4, that starting point on my graph. So it's not really, it's not a vertex or anything, it's not where we change direction, but this kind of end point or starting point, depending on how you look at it, is also going to dictate the domain and range for a, a square root function. And then for number two, h of x equals negative times the cube root of x minus two. So this negative out in front, that means that I have a reflection in the x-axis. And that just means that we reflect over the x-axis, so it flips over. 
and then the negative 2 or the minus 2 that's outside of the square root is a shift down 2 or a translation down 2. So if I want, I can plot the original points for my parent function up here. And then as we're making our transformations, we need to think about order of operations. So with order of operations, we would multiply by the negative first and then translate down two. So that's what we have to do first. We need to reflect and then translate down. So if I reflect this point from negative two, or sorry, negative eight, negative two, didn't go far enough over, sorry. Um, negative 8, negative 2, if I reflect it over the x-axis, it goes from negative 8, negative 2 to negative 8, positive 2. And then this point goes from negative 1, negative 1 to negative 1, positive 1. It's just flipping over the x-axis. The 0, 0 doesn't change. The 1, 1 changes to 1, negative 1. And the 8, 2 changes to 8, negative 2. And then so now these circle points are my reflection points. And then I can take each of those points and translate them down to. So this is going from negative 8, 2 to negative 8, 0. Just translating down 2. And then this is going from negative 1, 1 to negative 1, negative 1 if I go down 1, 2. 0, 0 is going down to 0, negative 2. 1, negative 1 is going down to 1, negative 3. And then 8, negative 2 is going to go down to 8, negative 4. And then we can connect through those points and finish our graph. And then for domain and range, because it's a cubic function or a uh, cube root function, we can put any value for x in and still get a real number out. It's okay if it's negative. So the domain is all real numbers. And then for the range, even though if I look at this graph, it looks like the lines are kind of flattening out. They are flattening out there, but they're never going to go completely flat. So this graph is still going to extend in the positive y direction forever and in the negative y direction forever. So the range is also all real numbers. So for example two, it says graph the following state domain and range. So with the more transformations you have on these functions, usually the easier, the safe it is to graph it with a table. So if I want to graph it with a table, I need to figure out like what x values that I can plug in to where I get a perfect square inside the radical. So it's not as easy as like just picking 0, 1, and 4 for x. You're going to have to do some experimenting to figure out which one gets those numbers inside of the radical once the inside is simplified. So I can set up my table x and f of x. And then I want at least three points on this graph since it's a square root graph. But I'm going to show you guys how to get four just so you can kind of play around with and, and avoid fractions if you're not super comfortable with them. So the first or the list of numbers that I want to get like inside of my radical so that I'm able to take the square root is I can do a zero. I can take the square root of one and I can take the square root of four. So those are what I want the inside of my radical to simplify to. But like if I put in a 0 right here, 2 times 0 is 0, minus 1 is a negative. I can't take the square root of that. So in order to figure out what actual x values we need to substitute in or choose for our table, I'm going to set 2x minus 1, the inside of the radical, equal to these three numbers and solve for x. And that will give me the x's for my table. So first I'll do 2x minus 1 equals 0. If I add the 1 over and divide by 2, I end up with x equals 1 half. So 1 half is my first x value. And then if I do the same, but I, this time I set it equal to 1 instead of setting it equal to 0, 
So 2x minus 1 equals 1. If I add the 1 over, I get 2x equals 2. And then divide by 2, you end up with x equals 1. So x equals 1, that's the next value on our table. We're going to do the same thing for 4 now, the next perfect square. So 2x minus 1 equals 4. If I add the 1 over, I get 5. Divide by 2, I get x equals 5 halves. So 5 halves is the next value in my table. But you don't necessarily have to use those specific numbers. The most important thing is that you find the x value that makes the inside of the radical 0 because that's going to be like the starting point of your graph and the basis of the domain and range. But say I didn't really want to graph 5 halves, I could try to figure out, um, like I can go up to the next perfect square, so I can go up to 9. So if I set 2x minus 1 equal to 9, I'll end up with a whole number. So if I add the 1 over, I get 10, and then if I divide by 2, I get x equals 5. So if I don't feel like graphing the 5 halves, I can use x equals 5, and that'll leave me with a whole number instead. So it's up to you on what you do. The big thing is that you just need 3 points no matter what, or at least 3, and then you need to start with whatever makes the inside of the radical 0. So we start substituting, substituting in our x values. So negative square root of 2 times 1 half is just 1. And then 1 minus 1 is 0 minus 3. So the square root of 0 is 0. Negative 0 is still 0. So 0 minus 3 is negative 3. If I substitute in 1, 2 times 1 is 2. Minus 1 is 1 minus 3. So the square root of 1 is 1, negative 1 minus 3 is negative 4. If I input 5 halves, 2 times 5 halves is 5, minus 1 is 4, minus 3. And then the square root of 4 is 2, so negative 2 minus 3 is negative 5. And then if I input 5, 2 times 5 is 10, minus 1 is 9, minus 3. So the square root of 9 is 3, make it negative, negative 3 minus 3 is negative 6. And then we can go ahead and graph those points. So 1, negative 3, or sorry, 1 half, negative 3, I'm going right half, and then down 3. And then 1, negative 4, right 1, down 4. And then 5 halves, negative 5. So 5 halves is, I don't think I went over far enough on that. <coughs> 5 halves, and it's like 2 and a half. <coughs> Sorry. And um, so we'll go over like 2 and a half and then down negative 5. And then after that, we also have like the fourth point. So 5, negative 6. So we'll write 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then down 6. And then we can go ahead and connect those points. We just have to know that the graph isn't going to go beyond this first point, the point that we got from like whatever made the inside of the radical 0. And then from there, because it's a square root function, we have a like domain restriction. It's always domain and range restriction is always just based on like this first point, the starting point. So the domain is if this x coordinate is one half, the domain can either be one half or anything larger than it. So x is greater than or equal to one half. And then for the range, the range is also dependent on whatever this point is, but now it's we're focusing on y. Um, we just also know, have to note that because this graph has been reflected, it's not just going to be y is greater than or equal to, because this now becomes a high point. So this point is negative 3, and then y can be negative 3 or any point below it because the graph starts to go down. So y is less than or equal to negative 3 because of the reflection.
And then for example two, g of x equals x plus one to the one third power. So anytime you have a like graph where it's like to the a, a rational exponent, if it makes it easier, just change it to a radical right away. So like g of x equals x plus one to the one third, you can rewrite it as g of x equals the cubed root of x plus one. And then you can kind of honestly graph it based on the transformations from there because like this is just shifting left one. But for the sake of like practicing with the table, I'm gonna make a table. Um, just in case you get to a point where like there's too many transformations to graph purely based on that. So with a cube root function, so if I have x and g of x, you if you're making a table for the cube root functions, we're not just focusing on the like 0, 1, and 4, like we were at the square root functions, because you like you can't take the square or the cubed root of 4, so that doesn't do you any good. You have to focus on like the smallest perfect cube, so negative 8, negative 1, 0, 1, and 8. So that's what I want the inset of my radical to simplify to. So I have to pick the x's that are going to get me negative 8, negative 1, 0, 1, and 8 inside here. So like if I want to get negative 8 inside the radical, but I'm adding 1 to the x, my x has to be negative 9. Because negative 9 plus 1 would get me negative 8 inside the radical. If I want there to be a negative 1 inside the radical, my x has to be negative 2, because negative 2 plus 1 would be negative 1. If I want a 0 to be inside the radical, my x has to be negative 1. If I want there to be a 1 inside the radical, my x has to be 0. And if I want there to be an 8 inside the radical, my x has to be 7. So for cubed root, you're looking for negative 8, negative 1, 0, 1, and 8 inside the radical after it's been simplified. And then we can start to substitute these values in. So the cubed root of negative 9 plus 1, so negative 9 plus 1 is negative 8, and then the cubed root of that is negative 2. And then the cubed root of negative 2 plus 1, negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. The cubed root of that is negative 1. The cubed root of negative 1 plus 1, negative 1 plus 1 is 0, and the cubed root of that is 0. The cubed root of 0 plus 1, 0 plus 1 is 1. The cubed root of that is positive 1. And then the cubed root of 7 plus 1, 7 plus 1 is 8, and the cubed root of that is 2. And then we can go ahead and graph those points. So negative 9, negative 2. And then negative 2, negative 1. Negative 1, 0. 0, 1. And then 7, 2. And then we can connect our points. Just make sure you curve it through the middle. and then state our domain and range. So because it's a cubic function, our domain can be anything because we can put in any x value and get a real number out. And so our range can also be anything. We're going to eventually, we can eventually get every possible output value. It just may take a while if, because the output is gonna grow slower than the input because of the shape of the graph. So domain is all real numbers. The graph is going to extend in both directions of x forever, and then the range is also all real numbers. The graph is going to extend in both directions for y forever as well.